Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to this mini plenary session titled Policy and Sexual Minorities. My name is Preeti Pathella. I am with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Bureau of Sexually Transmitted Infections. And I'm delighted to moderate this session. We have a fantastic lineup, Drs. Bernstein, Espelage, and Garofalo. And the format for the session is that we will have each presenter give their talk, and then we'll reserve the questions and answers for the end. So please enter your questions into the chat box and we'll get to them in a bit. And without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kyle Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is the Chief of the Epidemiology and Statistics Branch in the Division of STD Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prior to coming to CDC, Dr. Bernstein worked for the San Francisco Department of Public Health, the California Department of Health Services, the Baltimore City Department of Health, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Bernstein has extensive experience conducting innovative epidemiologic research in both academic and public health settings, and is a recognized expert and leader in the field of STD and HIV prevention. He has authored or co-authored more than 150 scientific journal articles. He received a BA from Brown University and both Master of Science and PhD degrees in epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins uh, University Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, Dr. Bernstein will be speaking about STD risk behaviors among men who have sex with men and women. So take it away, Kyle. Great, thank you, Preeti. And thank you for the conference organizers for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, we were asked to include a photo of ourselves, so I tried to sexy up my uh, disclosure slide. Um, so you can see that I've uh, memorialized my COVID mustache in this face mask. Um, I have no disclosures, and here's the standard CDC uh, disclaimer. So before I get started, I did want to just provide a couple of disclaimers. Um, today I'm going to be focusing on uh, male men who have sex with men and women or bisexual men in the United States. When I was uh, originally asked to speak on this topic, I had thought about also focusing on uh, women who have sex with women and women who have sex with both men and women, but realized that that was just much too much material to cover in the short amount of time I have. But I encourage you and the um, folks listening in to take a look at the growing literature about female um, bisexuality and STDs and sexual health among lesbian populations. My second caveat is that data is quite sparse on this topic, so I will be providing what data I could find, but there's um, quite a bit of holes, and it is definitely not as robust of an epidemiology as with other uh, risk populations that we talk about. And finally, um, I'm going to be taking an amuse-bouche approach. So again, I have a very short period of time, so I will be taking you through a tasting menu of topics related to uh, MSMW and bisexual men's sexual health. This is not going to be comprehensive, but I encourage you to take a look at some of the references that I will be providing. So I'd like to start out by uh, presenting a definition, which I think is really great. So this is from uh, Robin Oakes, I think that's how you pronounce his or her name, um, who is an activist, and they define bisexuality as the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex and or gender, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. And I think you'll get a better sense of the power of this definition as I go through my slides. So if I could present something in four dimensions, I would have done it that way. But since that's not physically possible on a Zoom or even in just reality, I've decided to create this box. And I think it's really valuable to think about men who have sex with both men and women or bisexual men on four primary axes, behavior, attraction, identity, and community. I'm going to go through each of these. So as an epidemiologist, I tend to be mostly focused on things related to sexual behavior because it's very easy to put those into boxes. And as an epidemiologist, I like to put people into boxes. And we usually identify or classify men who have sex with men and women or bisexual men based on their sex partners. But there's a lot of nuance which is often missed here. So for example, when we ask about partners, what genders are those partners? 
what kinds of sex are you having? Are you having anal sex, oral sex? Is there just kissing? Is there just mutual masturbation? Importantly, we also need to keep account of when these events happen. So some surveys ask men, have you ever had sex with another man in your lifetime or the past five years or the past 12 months? And depending on these time frames, you're going to classify people very differently. Additionally, and related to frequency, or uh, when is frequency. So have you had sex with a man once or twice in your lifetime, or are you actively engaged in sex with another man in the last um, month? Moving on to identity, this is how persons may identify themselves. And within the context of this talk, there's a range of identities that people may use. For example, men who have sex with men and women or bisexual men may identify as gay, they may identify as bisexual, pansexual, queer, genderqueer, or straight. Um, and I really, um, I really encourage you to read this growing literature that talks a lot about how these identities are used and demonstrate that um, MSMW or bisexual men use multiple concurrent identities and that there's a lot of heterogeneity in how they come to use these identities and when they choose to use them. So they're sort of situational. It allows men to access the best quote unquote possible option for the situation that they're in. And because heterosexuality has social value, it's possible for MSMW uh, or bisexual men to, who have any attraction to females to feel like they can qualify as straight if the situation occurs. The third axis I wanna talk about is community. And this is the, the group of people that you identify with or you intersect with on a larger level. And what's interesting about the MSMW bisexual population is that there's not really a lot of access to services and media specifically focused to them. MSM bisexual men also lack well-defined uh, communities. There are not generally physical locations geared toward bisexual men, as opposed to uh, gay men or um, lesbian populations where there may be bars or clubs or different groups. Those are much less prevalent among bisexual men. And we know from data that men who have sex with both men and women are much less likely to be engaged in the gay community than men who have sex with men. Finally, the fourth axis I wanna talk about is attraction. And this is how um, you actually feel about different genders in terms of, of uh, relationships or sexual arousal. Um, research has shown that this usually develops as a sense of quote unquote, feeling different during childhood between the ages of seven to nine. And that for men who have sex with men or bisexual men, there may be efforts to create homo or heteroerotic desires through dating and sexual activity with the opposite sex. And that any degree of opposite sex interest may support the notion of heterosexuality as an option, kind of encouraging if you try hard enough and focus on it hard enough, you can identify as straight. So looking at the data that exists on the populations in the United States, um, this is a gamish of a bunch of data and the references here at the bottom. But if starting from the left, using a definition of sex with another man, 5.8% of men in the United States report that they've had sex with another man since puberty. 0.7% report sex with another man in the past year. When we look at uh, bisexuality as an identity, 2.6% of all aged men report being bisexual and 1.5% of 14 to 17 year olds. And then finally, in looking at adolescent populations, a recent uh, analysis says that about 8% of 13 to 17 year olds identify as bisexual, which represents about 2 million young people. So while we tend to think of these as small populations compared to other groups, they're quite large in the absolute value. This is a nice study that was done in 2017 by the University of Connecticut and Stanford that asked um, a representative sample of people in the United States a series of questions about their sexual behavior, attraction, and activity. And here we see the top uh, vertical or horizontal uh, bar is straighter heterosexuals and that the vast majority, 96%, report that they're only attracted to opposite gender. Moving down to the bottom bar, which are gay and lesbians, the vast majority, 
report that they're attracted to only to the same gender. But when we look at the bisexual bar in the middle, we see that this is a pretty wide distribution and that it ranges from a small percentage reporting only being uh, uh, attracted to the opposite or same gender, but that there's variation in that middle part. Additionally, in the same survey, when po folks were asked about their, um, their relationship status, straight or heterosexual persons, the vast, the, the overall 100% of them reported they were in an opposite sex relationship. Among gay and lesbians at the bottom, 94% reported that they were in a same sex relationship. And then we look at the bisexual group in the middle, where the vast majority, 88%, reported that they're in an opposite sex relationship. So I think this highlights the, the variability in relationship status and sexual partnering among this population, that it's dynamic and changes. So in a review of some of the data that differentiates men who have sex with men and women populations compared to men who have sex with men only populations, there's some consistent findings that we see across the, the studies that have been published. So in general, bisexual men compared to gay men have lower income, have less access to health insurance. They're less likely to be out to their provider. They're less likely to report condomless anal sex with a male partner. If they're HIV infected, they're less likely to be in HIV care or virally suppressed. On the right side of this slide, these are the, uh, the characteristics that seem to have an increased prevalence among bisexual men. And that includes giving or receiving money for sex, using injection drugs or any poly drug use, increased prevalence of depression, homelessness, intimate partner violence, and physical assault. So when, um, <clears throat> in this analysis that was published in 2014, uh, Friedman and colleagues did a meta-analysis comparing the HIV prevalence in men who have sex with men only, or MSMO, with men who have sex with men and women and I just wanna point you to the bottom little bar, which is in black, which is the summary estimate here, which shows that across this range of studies, the HIV prevalence among bisexual men compared to gay men is about 50% lower. However, in the same analysis, when we compared bisexual men with men who have sex with women only, and I wanna focus you on that black bar again, we see that that prevalence is about five times higher. So in terms of HIV prevalence, bisexual men fall between the HIV, I'm sorry, fall between heterosexuals and gay men in terms of their overall HIV prevalence. In an analysis of N. Haynes data, which is a representative sample of the United States, uh, this uh, data suggests that gay identified men, the HIV prevalence is approximately 17% in the United States, that among bisexually identified men, the prevalence is about 7.8 or 7.7 percent, and that among heterosexually identified men, the HIV prevalence is 0 0.3. And we know from several studies that men who have sex with men and women of color compared to white men who have sex with men and women are much more likely to be HIV infected. When we look at STD prevalence, we see a little bit of a different story. And again, there's, there's limited data here, but in an analysis of the National Survey of Family Growth, if you see on the left, the gay identified and bisexually identified STD prevalence is, is, uh, is fairly similar and significantly higher than what we see among heterosexually identified men. And in a study by Mustansky and colleagues, um, looking at uh, 18 to 29 year old MSM, the gay identified and bisexually identified prevalence of rectal STIs was similar. Although we do know that higher levels of internalized stigma and lower levels of sexual orientation disclosure are associated with HIV and STI diagnoses. So I wanna switch gears and talk a little bit about men who have sex with men or bisexual men as bridgers. And this is something that comes up often. And I wanna um, just highlight this book by J.L. King, which came out in 2004, which kind of moved this into the, the common, I think, popular press. Uh, J.L. King was on Oprah. And there was a lot of talk about um, men on the down low and are they contributing to transmission from gay communities into heterosexual communities. <clears throat> 
So there's very little data on this, and I would say that in the empiric studies where actual um, data has been collected, there's really minimal support of this bisexual bridge for HIV, and there's even less support um, for a bisexual bridge for other STDs. There's a large number of modeling studies which suggest that this is important, and what I do want to highlight is that the growing availability and access to molecular epidemiology, I think, is going to be a real boon to trying to disentangle what the potential role in sexual networks of men who have sex with men and women. So with respect to gonorrhea, there's been some great studies that have been done in Australia, in the UK, and New York City that have looked at the genomics of connected networks of gonorrhea cases and found that genetically linked clusters of gonorrhea demonstrate that there's possible bridging between MSM, men who have sex with men and women and females, but it's really difficult to infer network characteristics from genetics of gonococcal isolates. And this is some of the work that we're working on here at CDC, led by Katie Town and others in our division. Additionally, there's been some really interesting work that's been done on this with HIV and Alexa Oster's group in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention did a large analysis looking at the poll sequences from HIV reported in the United States between 2001 and 2012 and found that sequences from females with HIV were linked to MSM networks and that older MSM and black MSM were more likely to be linked to females. So I think in terms of better understanding bridging, we're gonna be able to link some of this molecular and genetic data with the network data that we're collecting empirically. I wanna switch gears again and talk a little bit about biphobia. And I think these are two really great examples of the diversity and heterogeneity of the bisexual population. So in 2016, I believe, the Washington Post uh, purported a really interesting um, study that was done by GLAD that monitors the representations of LGBT plus populations in the media. And this report found that bisexuals are often portrayed as one dimensional or typecast as villains. And here are some examples, Lady Gaga in American Horror Story. Um, the woman on the right is Felicity from The Catch. I'm not familiar with The Catch, I had to Google that. And then there's Frank Underwood from uh, House of Cards. Um, in the study, Glad wrote that bisexuals are often depicted as untrustworthy, prone to infidelity and are lacking a sense of morality. And that based on their 2019 assessment, bisexual characters make up only 26% of all the LGBTQ representations across all media outlets. And I think these perceptions are really amplified when we think about how bisexuals are perceived in the general population of the United States. There's a growing uh, body of literature that suggests that the way in which both straight and LGBTQ plus populations view bisexuality as an experimental stage, that bisexuals are promiscuous and untrustworthy in relationships. This has been confirmed in studies where bisexual men have been asked about their experience with providers, where their bisexuality is both dismissed as a phase and suggested um, promiscuity. Interestingly, societal biphobia is actually more prevalent than anti-gay sentiment in general, and is perpetuated by both heterosexuals and lesbians and gays. And this is a really nice study by Brian Dodge and his group um, out of Indiana. And they did a survey of a nationally representative sample of Americans in the United States and asked about their perceptions of different um, populations, including bisexual men. So the gray bars here represent, I strongly agree, the orange bars, I agree, and the blue bars, I somewhat agree. And I just wanna highlight that overall, the red represents the total agree, that 44% believe that people should avoid sex with bi men due to HIV risk. 34% believe that bisexual men are confused about their sexuality. And that 25% believe that bisexual men will have sex with anyone. And this is a general US population. So one of the interesting findings uh, that I've been doing when I was doing research on this was recently in the proceedings of the National Academies of Science, there was actually a paper that determined that was um, conducted to prove that bisexual orientation actually exists because a lot of folks were not convinced. So what was done, and here's an image here, is there was a penile ples plethysmography which is basically a man sits and watches erotica with uh, a strap on his genitals, and that measures the amount of um, an erection that the participant gets. 
And what this study found was that among a diverse sample of 606 male participants, that there were groups of men who were reporting attraction and demonstrating it through this uh, objective measure, um, attraction to both sexes. Um, and this is really critical information because it's objective and not based on self-report. And I encourage you to read this really interesting and robust paper. I'm gonna skip this slide just for the sake of time. So what are the implications of this? So from a clinical care perspective, I think it's important that healthcare be considered, um, should consider bisexual and MSMWs in terms of both their behavior and their identity. And this really highlights the importance of taking a non-judgmental sexual history for patients. So it's important for providers to know that they can perpetuate biphobia and in turn help prevent that perpetuation moving forward. I think extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia testing for this population is very important. It's also important to know that HIV prep use is lower in MSMW than compared to gay men, and that there's been no studies that have been conducted looking at those unique barriers. I think the other thing that's important is that focus needs to be on both male and female partners. So there's an STD HIV risk reduction message that needs to be conveyed, but there's also pregnancy prevention and contraceptive services that need to be entering into the discussion. From a surveillance and epidemiologic perspective, MSMW are often uh, dumped into the larger quote unquote MSM population when we do our epidemiologic analyses. And I think this really hinders our ability to understand the heterogeneity in this population. So if we can analyze MSMW separately when possible, I think that's really valuable. We often also run into a problem with a small N. And I think as demonstrated by some of the data here, pooled studies may be a way to improve the statistical power by combining results from several smaller samples into something much more robust. I think most studies also focus on behaviors and don't really think about the identity, community, or attraction. And I think it's important to think about what of these is most important and what are you really trying to capture? Finally, MSMW are a heterogeneous group and analysis should explore and document that variability in risk, disease burden, and potential avenues for intervention. From a prevention standpoint, most explorations of LGBT health focus on men who have sex with men and have little content on bisexual identified populations. So thinking about developing bisexual specific messaging programs and services may be really valuable. Minimal focus has been on the sex partners of MSMW or bisexual men. And this has really been focused mostly on bridging. And I think there's a lot of value in trying to encourage providers to have the discussion about reproductive health concerns and contraceptive services for female partners and not just focus on those male partners. And then condom use among this population is often based on the gender of partners and perceived risk of pregnancy. So MSMW report female partners are quote unquote safer than male partners in terms of HIV risk and pregnancy prevention is the primary concern with their female partners. So in conclusion, MSMW or bisexual men encounter unique forms of stigma and shame which have implications in supporting prevention and clinical care. And innovations in epidemiology and surveillance, prevention and clinical services could help improve the health of this often overlooked population. And I do wanna wish everyone a happy Bisexual Awareness Week. It is actually going on right now, which is very fortuitous. It was not planned this way, it just happened. So everyone have a happy Bisexual Awareness Week. And I would like to just take a second to acknowledge um, some colleagues here, particularly Michelle Johnson-Jones, Lizzie Taroni, Katie Town, Tom Peterman, Seb Giral, and Karen Schlanger. And here is my contact information and I'm happy to answer any questions by email. And that is it, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. We're gonna have to do a shift right now and move backwards in time and think about kids in K through 12 settings where I do most of my work. Um, looking at, uh, if there's sort of a slide of 20 years ago, it would say bullying among LGBT youth. Um, we've, we've become more enlightened and now we'll use the terminology of gender and sexual minority youth. Although some of the studies I'll show will use 
um, that acronym that's not as sensitive to what we're seeing out there. I also apologize in some sense it may feel as if I'm talking about the binary world. Um, in the K through 12 settings, you can imagine it's really difficult to do this work, one, to even ask sexual orientation or attraction, two, to ask sexual behavior. So we're getting better with this, um, but it, it really does depend on the climate and the school districts and their willingness to come in. Anyway, I'm Dorothy from UNC. I have no disclosures and no picture, but you can see me on the video. Um, and anything that I say does not represent the opinion of CDC or NRJ or any other funders uh, that has supported this work. Um, so most of my work and a lot of the work that Dr. Bernstein just talked about is centering around minority stress and mental health. Um, and we have now taken some of this minority stress to try to understand how bullying and peer victimization may lead to adverse outcomes um, for gender and sexual minority uh, adolescents largely. We don't ha have much uh, permission to go in and talk to elementary school kids about this. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is really from seventh grade on. Um, but this is a conceptualization we've used in our suicide work as well as um, some risky sexual uh, studies that I'm going to talk about. But I'll, I'm going to hone in on the biggest part of the literature and that's looking at the extent to which um, the minority stress contributes to um, a number of stigma related stressors in addition to adolescent stressors that they have. So you can imagine the combination then leads to um, other adverse outcomes. And we have a very short period of time to talk here. The slides are available to you. Certainly you can reach out to me to get any articles or any additional writing um, here. Um, and so we have uh, since early 2000s established that uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth uh, experience high rates of bullying and peer victimization compared to their straight identified youth. Um, some of this work was established strongly by the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network and GLSEN and GLSEN's research team that have been out in the schools collecting these data um, at the national level. And we certainly have um, confirmed this in a number of our studies. Um, we also have had great success after lots of pushback over the last couple decades, and anybody that does this work actually knows um, that this is challenging work to do, especially within K through 12 settings um, and in conservative pockets in this country where when you do this work, you, you are sometimes accused of pushing a certain agenda. But we were successful with my colleague, Joe Robinson, to be able to publish the first paper in an education-focused journal, actually the leading journal, Educational Researcher. Um, and I think in large part, they published this paper because um, straight identified youth had less um, unexcused absences. To put it another way, LGBTQ had risk, higher risk of suicidal thoughts and attempts, victimization by peers, which supports the work that we had, we had known about. But certainly there are being some push out in the schools. Um, other works has shown that these kids, as they experience victimization and ostracization in heteronormative types of schools, may end up in our alternative school settings and their educational trajectory may be changed for a lifetime. I do wanna make it clear because sometimes this research is construed that all kids that are identified as gender or sexual minority are having a hard time in K through 12 settings. That's absolutely not true. So there's certainly those kids in this community they have a diverse risk profile. We do have supportive and affirming schools, not as many as I would like, um, but when they are at risk, they seem to be um, mid-level or extreme risk, which supports lots of the meta-analysis that are out there. Again, we don't know what's happening prior to seventh grade. Most of the IRBs will not allow us in school districts to come into the elementary school, kind of track this progression. So we can assume that the victimization has probably happened in elementary school, but we just picked up on it at the seventh grade level. Um, and so in this particular study, I just want to point out some things that confirm um, the research that's out there. This is uh, 2018 and 19 data out of Dane County. Dane County, Wisconsin has been surveying their youth and asking around the experiences of gender and sexual minority youth for 20, 25 years, quite progressive. When we look at, and because uh, Dr. Bernstein was talking about the small end problem, you really do when you want to have a big enough sample size to look at gender and sexual minority youth, and then some of these uh, low base rate behaviors, whether that's suicide or risky sexual behavior, 
behaviors, you need a big sample. Dane County offers that. So these are high school samples where we have 761 LGBTQ students compared to straight identified kids, which you see is 11,000. And I'll just kind of go through these quickly given time. But um, this confirms even in 2018 um, and 19 that gender and sexual minority youth um, um, perceive more school violence and crime and feeling unsafe in their school compared to straight identified youth. They experience uh, higher rates of peer victimization. This is one paper that actually showed that they're actually experiencing other forms of victimization. So when we're thinking about uh, victimization, there is a spillover into the teen dating violence world, uh, which should be a cause for concern when we think about sexual risk taking behaviors as well. So I encourage any students that might be watching this, that this is, we need more data on intimate partner violence among high school students in the United States. Um, in addition to that, we've just validated that um, LGBTQ experience higher rates of anxiety in general and suicidal ideation and attempts, which is supportive of some of the YRBS data and, and other uh, data that have emerged in the last year. Um, we were very fortunate to, to be able to create a tool also. Kids like to joke and say that they're transgender when they're not transgender. And Joe Robinson um, in New York has come out with a screening tool to identify jokesters. Um, and so we're able to take them out and to use some propensity scoring matching to see if these disparities are real when we take out the mischievous responders of the jokesters. Um, so we were able to get a sample. You can imagine this is challenging that we have 197 transgender. There was a lot more transgender in there before we took out the mischievous responders. When we look at that, there is a very concern about um, their safety and crime and being the targets of those types of victimization in schools. They also experience high rates of peer victimization also high rates of teen dating violence. Um, and we've written about um, some of the, there's only maybe five or six papers written on teen dating violence among transgender youth. Um, and we've written, really have just speculated of why that would be. And if anybody would like to know some of the qualitative work, we can talk to you about what the adolescents are saying and why they stay in unsafe um, and almost violent situations and how it is that they um, may compromise their sexual health uh, to maintain that relationship as well, but need lots more work there. Uh, anxiety and suicidal ideations higher in the transgender uh, high school students here than the non-transgender. We need more of this work. It is really, really a challenge to get enough sample size to um, think about this issue. I also want to make it clear my lab has moved on to really understanding that it's not just about uh, gender and sexual minority status, but understanding the intersectionalities of race, um, and gender and gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, and we have certainly know from Marshall's meta-analysis in 2011 that LGBTQ youth um, present with higher rates of suicidality. This was just confirmed um, in Dr. Haschel's, my former student's uh, meta-analysis um, this year. Um, and this is a time we've got to remember that it's it's rough to be an adolescent out there and with the increased identification of bisexuality in the recent YRBS, it points to um, a lot of things that Dr. Bernstein said that we should try to understand what bisexuality looks like and how that complicates intimacy and identity and sexuality at the same time when we take into these perceptions that we just heard about that people have these biases towards bisexuality. Um, we know that not all of these youth present with mental health issues and disparities, um, but it's really just not understood within the K through 12 uh, situation. And we also recognize that we need to know more about how sexual orientation interacts with race, um, as well as extending it to disability status. So even fewer papers, we were able to publish one paper on this and it's, there's just maybe two other papers, one that just came out um, in 2020 in a special ed journal. Um, so we know that students who identify with one marginalized identity reported significantly higher rates of suicidal ideation um, than their heterosexual peers without a disability. So when we say disability versus non-disability, um, and then students who identify as LGBTQ with a disability surprisingly did not report higher rates of suicidality, but it seems like the identities of one or the other um, really did predict this. However, because this is the topic here, peer victimization, so having these intersectionality and the intersecting identities in 
the context of peer victimization appeared to exacerbate the negative relationship between um, these identities, either LGBTQ or disability and school connectedness and ultimately the suicidal ideation. Um, in that school connectedness buffered this relationship, um, but only if there were low levels of victimization, pointing to perhaps um, trying to prevent peer victimization and bullying in the K through 12 context may offer some relief to some of these students that identify as one of these identities. Although, um, and also, as I said, peer victimization exacerbated the relationships for students who identified in both. So um, if you have both a disability and you identify as gender and sexual minority youth, um, victimization kind of exacerbated the relationships between depression, anxiety, and suicidality. And unfortunately, school connectedness is not the panacea to, to help these particular um, students. Um, and so again, you know, just adding victimization to this dynamic of intersectionality seems to predict higher levels of adverse outcomes for these students. And so when we think about, I'm always thinking about my work and thinking about implications for schools. I, you know, when we think about anti-bullying programs, most of them do not talk about gender and sexual minority status at all. Most of the bullying prevention programs are very binary and very heterosexual in the ways in which they present interactions. Um, so we need to start focusing on reducing bullying, especially for these students with stigmatized inter intersecting identities. Um, we are showing some progress for social mo promise for social emotional learning programs being effective with students with disabilities, but we're one of the only labs that have done an RCT um, looking at students with disabilities specifically. Um, it is very obvious when we're out in the field that teachers generally don't understand this difference between gender, sex, transgender, um, unless they're just enlightened. But for the most part, uh, Glisten and others would say we need to increase teachers' awareness and efficacy around these issues. Um, and provide resources for students dealing with minority stress and coping strategies and gay straight alliances, which I'll talk a little bit more um, nearing the end. Um, we have a whole body of research of trying to understand what is about the climate that contributes to kids not feeling connected um, and why, how it is that it then leads to other forms of aggression and victimization in K through 12 settings. Uh, my former student, Paul Petit, who's a leader in this area at Boston, um, college uh, identified homophobic name calling as both a precursor um, to bullying, also a consequence of bullying, a moderator, a mediator, homophobic name calling is quite pervasive and continues to be in our schools. Um, this all this body of research suggests that most school environments are hostile towards gender and sexual minority youth, and it creates a negative environment. So we should pay attention to school belonging, which I'll show you some more of that data. Um, as we sit here in 2020, we had surveyed kids earlier this year. Homophobic name calling is quite prevalent um, to the tune of two out of five um, boys, one out of three boys and two out of five girls in report really engaging in high rates of ho directing homophobic epithets to both their friends who they don't know. Um, and bullying prevention programs need to consider a discussion of this language that marginalizes gender nonconforming LGBTQ youth, which um, not many do unless you're in a progressive school district. Um, and unfortunately, it's an uphill battle here. Um, our other work has shown that it doesn't stop with homophobic teasing perpetration. And that actually is a precursor to sexual harassment perpetration. And our other work predicts intimate partner violence in high school um, or what we call adolescent relation aggression. We know little about how that plays out within the context of gender and sexual minority relationships. So another area that is uh, ripe for investigation. Homophobic name calling is prevalent. Um, those kids, and we have the bully sexual violence pathway, so kids that engage in high rates of bullying in early middle school will escalate to gender-based kind of commentary in the form of homophobic name calling, and that sets the stage for sexual harassment um, into high school. Um, and so with an eye on looking at kind of um, intervention, we have found in our first randomized clinical trial, uh, which was funded by Centers for Disease Control, uh, we wanted to be able to create uh, an improvement in school climate. And this is a large trial, so I'm just going to flip through. Certainly you have the slides and I can send you the articles here. We, what we did was we evaluated 
a social emotional learning program at the middle school with about 3,600 kids with 36 schools in Illinois and Kansas. Um, and I'm just going to take this huge three year trial and sum it up um, in the middle school years that we had reductions in physical aggression, bullying, cyberbullying, homophobic name calling, and sexual harassment across the three year middle school study. Greater reductions, of course, when it was implemented with fidelity. Um, we have a meta analysis there uh, that you could look at that again. Just ask me any questions. Thank you, National Institutes of Justice for uh, giving me a grant to then track these kids over time. Our main outcome analysis uh, showed an indirect effect, not a direct effect, and that if you were in an intervention school, your sense of belonging and connectedness at school went up, and all forms of aggression at high school six years later um, uh, went down. Uh, we then started to look at, okay, if school belonging seems to be critical, what does that look like for gender and sexual minority youth? And so this is a, um, a short-term longitudinal study where we found that peer victimization led to lower school belonging and school belonging um, led to um, compromised mental health. And this is a sample of gender and sexual minority youth. We followed this uh, with a more extensive longitudinal study and found that sexual harassment victimization um, being a target of that sexual harassment victimization also was associated with the decrease in school belonging. But if that school belonging was there, there was also a decrease in internalizing symptoms over time. Uh, and so I wanted to show you here the peer victimization and what we find in sexual risk differences um, and just break this down. This was published in 2013 in the American Journal of Public Health. And there was 11,000 kids, again, from Dane County, Wisconsin. We had eight uh, sexual risk variables, engaging in sexual activity, having any sexual partners, any anonymous sexual partners, having sex under the influence, not using protection, having been tested for STI, perceptions of their willingness to get tested or getting an STI, and then knowledge of condom effectiveness. Um, across all of these outcomes in middle school and high school, LGBTQ identified youth reported engaging in riskier behavior more than the heterosexual identified youth, even after we controlled for victimization. So victimization is, even when we controlled, there's disparities with still there. We did find that lesbian, gay, and bisexual identified youth generally appeared at be most risky um, and questioning identified youth least risky. But if anybody knows the questioning um, category is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, it's very clear here that interventions need to be implemented early in middle school um, and address unique risk patterns um, among these subgroups. Uh, we also found very, very important that even if we had the panacea of reducing peer victimization and bullying, which, by the way, we only reduce it by 17% in general, um, there's still going to be uh, sexual risk dis disparities that we've documented here. Um, some of our work has not, not only identified school connectedness and belonging as a risk factor, but also other protective factors like parental support and self-compassion. Again, in this particular study, we found that sense of school belonging and connectedness was the pro most profound protective factor. As I indicated before, we've got to think about doing some basic research and not assume that all of our teachers and staff in K-12 through settings understand these basic terminologies. Uh, we can look at the policy. They're slow to change over time. Um, Gay Straight Alliances, NIH is funding some of this work um, and showing great promise that if you have a highly functioning Gay Straight Alliance that involves both gay and straight uh, individuals and youth, that um, there's promising in reducing truancy, injury, and fewer suicide attempts. We have to teach um, this, this to teachers in um, before they get to the schools and have ongoing training as well. And then um, our findings support the minority stress theory throughout. Uh, LGBTQ youth report higher rates of victimization, teen dating violence, and shows a real complex nature involving the intersectionality and multiple forms of victimization. We looked up here in dating as well. Uh, prevention programs need to minimize this language that stigmatizes these youth and look at look at the extent to which um, programs can incorporate that language. We need to do more work within teen dating violence prevention programs such that prevention programs actually include uh, kids that date that are non-heterosexual. Um, and uh, again, just more support for the kids at the school. And Dr. Bernstein has talked about what needs to happen as far as data and so that we can do this work more systematically. Uh, I encourage you all to take a look at this PowerPoint and thank you for your time.
is this is Rob Garofalo. I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be going or not because I, I have some text. Yes, uh, apologies. I think you can. I think we lost Preeti. Okay, so uh, I'm my name is Rob Garofalo. I'm a, the division head of adolescent medicine at Lurie Children's, and I'm going to talk really fast. And I'm cooked. This is a first for me because I'm completely blinded to what you all can see. But I'm going to talk you through the slides and sort of name each slide as I go through them to make sure that we're on the same. Page. So next slide. So Dr. Bernstein already uh, did a number, gave you a, a bit of a discussion about terms and definitions. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here. Next slide. But I do want to talk about um, sexual health and STIs as it relates to transgender, gender nonconforming populations. So when we think about gender, there are different ways to conceptualize it. One is gender identity, which would be an internal sense of being male or female or neither or somewhere in between versus gender expression, which is really an ex someone's external appearance of one's, gender of one's gender identity and how it might be expressed through like clothing, behavior, a haircut or voice. And it may not conform to sort of socially defined uh, behaviors, roles, or characteristics. Then there's a term sex assigned or designated at birth, which is distinct from gender. And that's really an assignment really made at birth generally uh, by the basis of chromosomes or anatomy. And I think of recently, there's been a lot of discussion about these gender reveal parties, right, that led to these, potentially led to these fires in California. And one of the things that drove me crazy about that is it's really not a gender reveal party because you can't reveal someone's gender at birth. It, it should be a what kind of anatomical parts does my baby have at birth reveal party because it's not really at all about gender identity or gender expression. You know, there are sort of legal designations, and at least in Illinois now, Illinois has approved non-binary state IDs, but gender neutral options may not be available for a number of years. But now we've begun to understand gender identity and expression as, uh, as the previous speaker spoke to, not in binary terms, but really as sort of a, a broad umbrella. And I'm not at all going to talk about sexual orientation or, or, or sexual attraction, or I'm really going to focus on, next slide, uh, the transgender community or people whose gender identity is different from their sex assigned at birth. So going back to the terms that we used before. Increasingly, I think those of us that do this work in a clinical sphere, you know, I run the sex and gender development program here at Lurie Children's. We're coming across particularly young people who really identify as non-binary, whose gender identity lies somewhere in between being that of distinctly male or female. Um, and then there are people such as myself who, who we might identify as cisgender, or whose gender identity is the same as their sex assigned at birth. I'm also not going to be talking about intersex or DSD populations. There's been a lot of um, interest lately, particularly at my hospital, about um, uh, these individuals um, and these conditions and, and surgical procedures in infants. And I'm, I'm going to confine my talk to really transgender populations here. Next slide. So when we think about sexual health and transgender populations or sexually transmitted infections, there's no way to really get around that the lion's share of the public health interest has really been centered on, on HIV, even my own work. And so the preva prevalence of laboratory confirmed HIV infections across studies is close to about 20% for transgender women, which really represents about a 49 increased, increased odds when compared to other populations worldwide. Less is known about transgender men, but we, we suspect and increasingly data suggests that even transgender men or transmasculine individuals face an increased risk of HIV as well. And it's really been within that public health lens that most of the interest in transgender uh, populations has grown. And to that extent, even my own work, Life Skills, which you see one of the images here, is, is one of only two sexual risk reduction interventions that are, that are designated by the CDC to have an evidence base. The other one is by um, Christy Amarell and, and Don Operario out of Brown in uh, Michigan, and, and they've done some really good work with couples. Um, but really, it wasn't until the Institute of Medicine, and it was one of the great honors of my career to be on the Committee for the Health of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People, where the entire focus of that tome really was to break down the stigma of seeing transgender people only within this very myopic lens of their HIV risk, and really to think about them from a much broader public health perspective. And that's what I hope to do a little bit today. But so the attention, I think, is both appropriate and it's a long overdue to think about transgender populations in this broader context. So what about other aspects of sexual health? 
Well, really, rates of sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, in transgender people are currently not documented as part of any U.S. national surveillance effort. And so that's, the, you know, really, if there's one take-home message here, it's, it's that there's, we're really missing opportunities to better understand and to define a population. And to be honest, really from a public health lens or perspective, with regard to allocations of resources or services, in order to count, you actually need to be counted. And for transgender populations or transgender people, they're often not counted. And so there's missed opportunities here. Next slide. So when we look at the state of the science, I mean, there really was not a lot, and I'm really appreciate, really appreciative of this team from UAB that had an abstract at the Sexually Transmitted Infections Conference, which was a prevalence of STIs and HIV in transgender women and men, and they did a systemic review. And really, there were only 32 articles, which you know speaks to the increased attention to this work and surveillance that needs to be done. Most of those articles were on trans women. Very few included data on trans men. Um, almost all of them, when they did focus on trans women, a lot of them focused mostly on sex workers and not, were not representative of a general population. Almost greater than 95% had, again, HIV as its primary focus. About half reported serologic data on, on syphilis. And, you know, less than half percent really presented data on other STIs, such as gonorrhea or, or chlamydia. And even of those studies, a very small minority reported on uh, urogenital and extragenital results. Among transgender women, the prevalence of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia really varied widely, as you can see here. And among trans men, some of the studies actually reported a 0% prevalence. But again, the, the, the prevalence of some of the STIs look like they might be somewhat smaller than transgender women, but again, uh, perhaps larger than the general population. But again, the fact that they're not um, counted as part of surveillance studies throughout the United States really limit our ability to, to accurately understand STIs in this population. Next slide. There were two studies. There was a CDC uh, funded surveillance effort in six cities that looked at chlamydia, gonorrhea, and HIV infections among uh, transgender women and men attending STI clinics. And again, I think, you know, some of these results are not surprising among the transgender women, which totaled over 500, uh, the, like about 12 to 13 percent tested positive for chlamydia and gonorrhea, at least in one anatomic site. And the prevalence rates for, for gonorrhea and chlamydia were, again, somewhat lower, but 7 to 10 percent for chlamydia and gonorrhea and trans men, again, at one or more of the anatomic sites. Most of the transgender women and about 25% of the transgender men in that study who had extra genital gonorrhea or chlamydia had actually negative urogenital test results at the same visit. And so that's important. I mean, when we're thinking about STIs with transgender populations, we need to think, again, more broadly than just collecting uro urogenital samples. There was another uh, systemic review by Dewart and colleagues, um, which looked at the prevalence of rectal chlamydia and gonorrhea infections, and again, Transgender women had the highest percentage of rectal chlamydia and gonorrhea when compared to either MSM or cisgender women. And again, you can see the weighted prevalence averages here are upwards of 25%. Next slide. But I really wanted to focus my talk on like, well, how do we reach transgender populations? And I, I've been doing this work with uh, transgender people long before it was popular, <laughs> long before there was money or interest um, and I was really struck by really this quote, and I always use it in almost all my talks because it, 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 it remains true to this day. And this was a quote from a very small study that I did at the beginning of my career from a 17-year-old Chicago transgender woman. And, and she said, preventing HIV in us girls is complicated. We need jobs, places to stay, food to eat, doctors. HIV is just one of the many problems that we have to deal with. So even though this transgender woman really spoke to about HIV, you can see that this would also be true when related to sort of STIs. And it speaks to sort of the global context um, of which sexual health fits for transgender populations and the fact that it exists in a complex environment that if we really want to reach and well serve this population, we need to carefully consider. Next slide. And when we think about that complex environment, I think it's really important to really understand perceptions of transgender populations. And so not a public health article, not a newspaper story or a television storyline or most movies generally that sort of speak to transgender populations tend to think of them from within this sort of spectrum of dysfunction. 
they're at risk of HIV and STIs, they're, they engage in commercial sex, they have mental health problems, they're, they can be victims of bullying or sexual assault or violence, and they can experience discrimination and homelessness and unemployment, and those are all true. Um, there are far too many transgender people that, that are, are victims of, of bullying and sexual assault. There are far too many transgender people that continue to acquire HIV and STIs. There are far too many transgender people that suffer from depression um, and homelessness. The trouble with that spectrum is that it's not an accurate spectrum of the entire view of transgender people. And I think when we think about trying to reach transgender populations, we also have to take a more balanced uh, view and look at them from within a positive perspective, from a positive perspective as being resilient and strong and self-determined and proud. So to see transgender people just within that spectrum of dysfunction is is disingenuous and fundamentally wrong. And it's also, it's just not accurate. And I think when we, when we want to try to tap into reaching hidden populations, be they transgender women of color or transgender men, I think we really have to recognize and understand their very strengths, as well as sort of acknowledging and continuing to work on the things that contribute um, to public health disparities. Next slide. So what are some of the do's and don'ts? Oh God, I only have four minutes. Uh, so when we're thinking about reaching transgender populations, if you wanna work with transgender people, what should you do? You should hire them, right? So if you wanna work with transgender people, the best way to be doing this work is to begin to hire some transgender people. And I can remember back in the day when I did this work at Lurie Children's, like that took some effort. You know, there are a lot of barriers to employment for transgender people, but they deserve opportunities for employment. And if you wanna reach this population, hire someone to help, to help you do this work. Don't just mimic approaches for men who have sex with men or gay and bisexual men. The transgender community has suffered long and hard enough. We should be designing programs that actually are specific to their underlying risks and the issues that they face and not just mirroring or developing programs that have been designed for gay men. It's insulting. We, we should not be seeing trans people as a homogenous umbrella. So there's a, a big difference when we're talking about reaching transgender women versus transgender men. And I don't have enough time to go into the non-binary. We also need to carefully consider racial ethnic differences as they're critically important when we're thinking about outreach efforts. We should be partnering with community-based agencies that are doing this work and, and in many cases doing it well. I work at an academic institution. Much of the work that we do with transgender populations is, is critically tied to targeted community-based agencies that help us do this work. We couldn't do it without them. We should be using different recruitment and engagement strategies. So like M Health strategies or peer leaders or peer navigators or networks. We should be using community health workers. And we should always approach this work with humility and empathy. You know, working with transgender communities has is, is been one of the um, most important aspects of my career. But I always approach this work with a great deal of humility and that I'm not an expert. I, I often learn from the transgender patients and their families that present in my care. And I think being humble when we're doing this work is really important. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit in, in my remaining two minutes about the clinical environment. Next slide. You know, it was U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch who famously told transgender Americans, we see you. Unfortunately, I think this current administration has eroded those principles a bit, but you can see from this slide, and I won't go into it, that transgender people face a lot of discrimination from within the healthcare system. Many have experienced health professionals that refuse to touch um, or use uh, precautions or health professionals that blame them for their health status or health professions that were physically rough or abusive. These are real things for transgender communities. Next slide. Transgender people often have many fears about accessing care, that they will be discriminated against, or there's not going to be services, or not support, not support groups, or that medical personnel are going to treat them differently just because they are trans. I used to sometimes feel when I was talking with transgender populations that I needed to somehow apologize for the entire medical profession, but what I've learned is, is not to apologize, but to acknowledge it and try to engage in a partnership with my transgender patients to make sure that the care that I'm providing in my clinical space and the clinical spaces that I have the opportunity to impact and change um, get better. Next slide. So in fact, there are things that you can do. I mean, at Lurie Children's, and this was no small feat at a pediatric hospital, we really work to have all gender or gender neutral bathrooms. We make sure that there are visible signs on our IDs that say that we are a safer or, or um, an approachable space for transgender or LGBT people to get care. 
we actually are, are me- members of the HRC sort of uh, healthcare quality index, which speaks to our policies. And we proudly place signs uh, throughout our facility that let transgender people know that this is a place where they can get care. All of our providers will wear these little buttons that will say things like, my pronouns are, in this case, mine would be he, him. Next slide. But the clinical language is important, right? Instead of when you're talking about body parts, instead of saying things like, since you're biologically female, use things like, since your body has ovaries or a uterus. And when we're talking about hormones, instead of saying, when you go through a female puberty, uh, say something like, well, when you go through puberty caused by estrogen. And body parts are really important, right? Because transmasculine persons might present in an emergency room with abdominal pain. And it's important to remember that they may still have anatomical parts like ovaries and a uterus. So in the differential diagnosis related to SDIs, abdominal pain could still be something like PID or cervicitis, or in rare cases, even ectopic pregnancy. For trans feminine people, they may present with, with urethral discharge or with signs of, of a clinical diagnosis of prostatitis because they may, they many, most of them will still have a prostate and that needs to be considered carefully in a differential diagnosis of symptoms, especially when, when doing a workup for, a, for an STI. Next slide. And again, I spoke to this already, but make sure that your institution and the organizations you work for that ha- have hopefully progressive policies. You know, Lurie Children's was the first hospital to, to have their board of directors approve a policy supporting the safety and well-being of transgender young people. And that was really meaningful to the families and the people that we care for. So this was like a rapid fire walk through STIs, and I'm already one minute over, but I hope this gave you a little bit of an overview of things that I feel are important when caring for and reaching out to the, to the transgender uh, community. So thank you very much. This is my contact information, and hopefully if there's still time for questions, I'll hang on the line. Hi, this is Preeti. I don't think I'm on video, but hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Garofalo, and apologies both to you and Dr. Espelage for not being able to give a proper introduction. Um, I do. We do have a couple of questions in the chat box, and so um, I think we can hang on for a few more minutes in this session. I do also want to mention that um, C, uh, CE credit is available for attendees of this session, so just a check the conference website for more details on that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Espelage, you're still on? Hello? <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> oh, is that you, Rob? Yeah. Okay. Um, well then, I will. I will. Um, maybe some other people are still in the session, and so I'll just um, put this question out to you: Is there a correlation between media and trans treatment and health? Is that to me? Yes. Uh, I mean, not a, certainly not a well-studied connection, but I, I mean, I think there's definitely you know there's been a change. I mean, you know, I can remember not a short time ago where, like, you know, every transgender person that was portrayed in media was, you know, a victim of a crime or committed a crime, you know, was a vi- and so things are changing rapidly. And I think with those changes in media come changing perceptions of, of the trans community. And so I, I, for one, am always an optimist and I remain hopeful that um, despite, I think, uh, recent changes to, to the negative with, with our current administration, that things over time will continue to progress and, and, and show more diversified images of this community, which I personally believe can only help ultimately when we talk about health disparities and health outcomes, including, I think, the stuff that Dr. Dressman has talked about in terms of bullying and, and the way young people are considered in schools. And she may have um, some words on that as well. Okay, and uh, we'll just do one final question because I know it's past the end of the hour and almost time for the next session, but um, back for you, Dr. Garofalo, we've developed, the question is we've developed several trainings for health educators that use gender neutral language, but continue to get pushback, especially from clinicians, that the general, quote unquote, general population will not understand what we are talking about when we stick to anatomy versus gendered language. And how would you respond to this type of pushback? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I appreciate that question, and I get that pushback every day, and I've experienced that pushback for years, even at my own institution, which I adore. I mean, I, I you know, I guess I, what I would encourage people to do is just continue pushing back on the pushback, right? Because this using gender-neutral language, using anatomy, really getting people to understand the distinction between sex and gender is really important. I mean, when I round, you know, almost every every month on the hospital and I'm talking to residents, it's amazing how common it is to conflate sex and gender. And so for people that are really working towards, um, you know, gender neutral language and, and a really more nuanced look at sexual health by uh, using survey instruments and using educational tools that are approaching it with that vantage point, I, my only suggestion would be to like, you know, have some resolve and keep pushing back because it's the work that you're doing is super important. Okay, so um, I would just like to thank the presenters for these very interesting and informative talks. Apologies again for the technical difficulties. Um, thank you also for uh, to all the attendees for tuning into this session. And with that, we will adjourn. Okay, thank you. Thanks again.